Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Farmer, and I'm the co-director of the Rand Epstein Family Veterans Policy Research Institute. I want to welcome, welcome everyone to this webinar today. This is part of our bi-monthly webinar series focused on high-priority veterans policy issues. Move to the next slide. Our Veterans Policy Institute has as its mission to conduct innovative interdisciplinary research to improve the lives of those who have served in the US military. We aim to publish and widely disseminate our research findings to connect objective and rigorous analysis to decision makers so that we can improve evidence-based decision-making. Couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. We have the chat feature open, so please feel free to ask questions or share resources that the audience may be interested in. To ask questions of the panelists, please use the Q&A feature, which is also open. Uh, we will monitor that and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Next slide. Today, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Meredith Claycamp. Meredith will present new research findings on Americans' perceptions of veterans based on a nationally representative survey of American adults through RAND's American Life Panel. Meredith's presentation will be followed by a panel discussion with our guest experts, Michael Meese and Melissa Bryant, moderated by my colleague, Kayla Williams. Meredith is a senior sociologist at RAND. Her primary research centers on the consequences of military service for service members, veterans, and their families, as well as military personnel policies and challenges. And with that, I'll turn it over to Meredith. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, thank you all for joining this webinar today. Um, thanks to Rand and the Epstein Family Veterans uh, Policy Research Institute for the opportunity to have conducted this research, but also to share some of the results from our recent report um, and to offer some insights into how Americans think about veterans and military service today. Next slide. For some context, um, the report that hopefully one of my colleagues can link in the chat um, stems partly from a concern that's been expressed by some about a growing civil military divide that might result from having fewer and fewer Americans who, who, who have ever served in the United States military. Having spent nearly two decades at war, fought with an all volunteer force, how do Americans feel about their veterans and why might those feelings matter? Prior research has provided evidence to suggest that connections to the military influence one's views of it. And as you can see from the chart here, the fraction of adults who have ever served in the military has declined substantially with an all-volunteer force. Um, in 2007, not even near the beginning of an all-volunteer force, roughly 10% of the population had ever served. 12 years later, that fraction is only 7%. Um, the rapid decline is largely driven by the mortality among the large cohorts of veterans who served in prior conflicts like World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So given that fewer and fewer Americans have themselves directly experienced military service and military life, we wanted to understand how the public thinks about veterans and military service. Next slide. So to understand Americans' views, Rand used our American Life Panel to survey the public about their perceptions. The ALP is a nationally representative, probability-based panel of more than 6,000 members ages 18 and older who are regularly interviewed and surveyed over the internet. Um, 4,500 ALP panelists were asked to take surveys in February and June of 2022, with approximately 2,400 individuals responding to each of those surveys. Next slide. So the full report um, provides detailed analyses of all of the survey data that we collected. Um, and I'm briefly gonna share a few selected results with you here. I'll start by pointing out what may be obvious to the people who would have voluntarily joined this call. And that is that military service is a highly gender stratified experience. Although the number of women who serve has been rising, the military remains a predominantly male force. And consequently, far more men report having served than do women. In our survey sample, approximately 21% of men reported having served compared to less than 2% of women. It's not surprising that men are also more likely to have, have, have friends who have served in the military given the gender differences in rates of service. Men were twice as likely as women to report that most of their friends had served, almost 11% uh, versus 5% of women. 
Nearly 30% of men and 36% of women, though, did not have any friends who had ever served in the military, suggesting some de potential degree of interpersonal isolation from military members and veterans. However, the complement of those numbers, a majority of Americans um, at least have some friends who have served, specifically 70% of men and 64% of women have at least, you know, some friends or more who have served. So while personal, personal military connections um, and military experience may be low, most Americans do have social ties to veterans, with men being more likely to have such ties than women. Next slide. We asked a number of questions about people's um, perceptions of veterans. We asked Americans um, in one section about a series of 13 positive and negative stereotypes people might hold about veterans. And we report some of the selected outcomes here on this slide. Uh, most respondents, approximately 50 to 80% of them, depending on which attribute we were asking about, associate veterans with very positive traits. There was much higher endorsement of positive stereotypes like being self-disciplined, responsible, loyal, and self-reliant. And there was very little endorsement of negative stereotypes with the highest being that 20% of respondents considered veterans to potentially be aggressive. Less than 10% of respondents agreed with the, the rest of the negative traits such as um, being volatile, cold, or uncompassionate. There were also notable demographic differences in the level of stereotype endorsements that varied again across each specific attribute. But in general, people who were 55 years and up, those who identified as white, people from the South and Midwest, people who were themselves veterans or had family members who were veterans, and people who identified as Republican tended to agree with the positive stereotypes at higher rates than other survey respondents. Next slide. In addition to being asked to select from, a, you know, select from the list of 13 stereotyped characteristics, respondents were separately asked whether they thought veterans were more reliable and more hardworking than, than the rest of society, and how likely a veteran was to do something violent toward themselves. The first issue, which is reported in the data right here, reflects a typical kind of claim that's often made in making a business case for hiring veterans, whom some argue uh, are better employees than non-veterans. And the second question reflects the concern that suffering from post-traumatic stress might raise the risk of veteran suicide, self-harm, or even potentially violence against others. Um, so you, as you can see here from the data on the first item, approximately two thirds of the public views veterans as more reliable and more hardworking than the rest of society. Next slide. But more than 40% also think it's likely that a veteran would do something violent toward themselves. So paradoxically, the public endorses views that suggest veterans may be more reliable and hardworking, i.e. likely to be you know, strong employees in the workforce, while also believing they may be capable of self-harm. Next slide. In a prior RAND study, which is not in the one that the report um, that, that these results are coming from, but we can also post a link to, to this prior study. In the prior study, um, researchers at RAND found that in general, American adults do not think that the country is doing a very good job in caring for its veterans. Three quarters of respondents thought that the country is doing a fair or poor job only in caring for its veterans and 87% 80, of them felt that the government could do more for our veterans. But we wanted to know in what areas specifically did Americans think the country could do more? Next slide. When forced to choose between different program areas, over half of Americans thought that veterans needed more mental health care services. Nearly one in five adults, 19%, thought veterans needed more housing support services. 15% thought veterans needed physical health care services and 9% thought they needed employment-related help. Among the 6% that chose other, we asked them to explain what they meant, and most said that veterans needed all of these things equally. Next slide. So understanding how Americans perceive veterans may be informative of their willingness to support government and non-government programs to assist them in getting the care and services they need or the benefits to which they're entitled. But how people perceive veterans may also feed back into whether or not they would encourage a young person to consider joining the military. It's one thing to hold uh, military members in high esteem in the abstract, 
but it's something altogether different to recommend military service as a career path. So to gauge the public's willingness to recommend military service, the ALP also asked Americans whether they would encourage a 17-year-old relative to join the military through enlisting or through a service academy or an ROTC program. Americans were more likely to encourage military service via what we call an officer pathway, that is joining through ROTC or a service academy. Um, and 62% would encourage or strongly encourage this. However, 55% of respondents would discourage or strongly discourage joining the military via the enlistment route. Um, as concerns about military recruitment grow, um, you may have seen this in the news um, or in your jobs, um, it's natural to wonder about the role of two decades worth of media coverage about veterans' challenges with PTSD, uh, traumatic, tra traumatic brain injuries, and challenges in receiving adequate care from the VA. Although the ALP surveys that we conducted did not include detailed questions directly asking about those specific um, relationships, we did uh, examine the associations between how people felt about veteran, veteran stereotypes um, and their willingness to encourage military service um, so as to motivate future research. And so although we don't present the figure here, I'll leave it as a teaser to go read the report where those analyses are presented, um, we did find, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, that those who held more positive perceptions of veterans had increased levels of encouragement um, and you know, willingness to encourage um, a relative to join the military. And those who held more negative perceptions about veterans were likely to have decreased uh, willingness to encourage enlistment. Those negative perceptions of veterans, however, had a stronger negative effect on willingness to encourage enlistment then did the positive effect of holding positive stereotypes. Um, in addition, through multivariate analyses, we found that there were differences um, in those relationships by political party, whether one knew a veteran. Um, and again, I would encourage you to read the, the full report um, to, to catch some of the nuances in the, in the more complicated analyses. Next slide. So just to conclude, um, the relationship between public opinion and attitudes and public policy is very complex, but the views held by the American people about veterans in the military have the potential to continue to shape the policy arena for years to come. Veterans are understood as a deserving target of public policies and how the public understands veterans today could sustain levels of their a perception of deservingness, could shape interest group advocacy and ultimately affect policy choices into the future. Veterans and their advocates rightfully express concerns about how military and veteran populations are portrayed in the media or in public discourse, and they've often voiced concerns about negative stereotypes about veterans. Our ALP survey data um, that, that we examined suggests that fears about the public holding outsized negative stereotypes about veterans are simply unwarranted, and that most stereotypes held are in fact overwhelmingly positive. To the extent that the public has some beliefs about negative stereotypes, um, they are around aggression and self-harm, but these negative stereotypes coexist alongside the overwhelmingly positive perceptions that they otherwise hold about veterans. And importantly, the public believes veterans deserve government support for these challenges. Perceptions of veterans as a possibly damaged, as potentially damaged physically or mentally by their service highlight that 20 years of war have led to widespread familiarity with the wounds um, that come from war. Currently, the top two reasons youth report for not wanting to join the military are the possi possibility of physical injury or death and the possibility of PTSD or other emotional or psychological issues. And so the public's willingness to consider joining the military or recommending that to others um, is likely to be influenced to some degree about by how they think about veterans and their experiences. Um, it is, however, encouraging that endorsement of negative stereotypes is quite low. Um, however, any potential increase in the endorsement of negative stereotypes in the future about veterans would be expected to have a larger negative influence on people's willingness to recommend military service to others than would the same level of increase in positive stereotype endorsement. Put another way, the public's willingness to encourage others to join the military is more sensitive to negative veter veteran perceptions than to positive ones. So we must sort of, you know, keep, keep ourselves um, attuned to that. And so while the public appears to support veterans and policies and programs to aid them, 
they may not want to encourage those close to them to become one. Thank you so much for your attention, and I really look forward to the ensuing conversation. With Thank that, you. I'll turn it over to Kayla. Sorry. It's fine. Thank you so much, Meredith. I really appreciate the presentation. It was a, a really helpful way to ground and inform the discussion that we're going to move into now. Uh, and I'd love everyone to please join me in welcoming our guest panelists, Army veteran Melissa Bryant, who has served in senior positions in IABA, the American Legion, and the Department of Veterans Affairs, and retired Brigadier General Michael Meese, who is president of the Armed Forces Mutual Aid Association. I'm Kayla Williams. I'm a senior policy researcher here at the RAND Corporation also an Army vet, so we do have a lot of Army representation on the webinar today. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, our panelists have really impressive bios that you can read in full on the webpage about this event, and I'm sure their unique areas of expertise are going to contribute to really rich discussion about how Americans perceive veterans and what that could mean not only for public support of policies benefiting veterans, as Meredith was just chatting about, also how civilians view military service and the military as an institution, which could be salient in this time of uh, challenging recruiting. I'm going to target most of my questions to specific individuals, but please do feel free to make this conversational. You can come off mute and jump in or give a little signal. Let me know you'd like me to share your uh, additional thoughts. And to those of you in the audience, as Carrie mentioned earlier, please feel free to post questions using the Q&A button at any point, and I'll turn to those a little bit later in our moderated discussion. If you want to pull down the slides and we can dive right in. Um, Meredith, I want to turn to you first and ask if there's anything that surprised you about these survey results, or if there's anything that you think is particularly ripe for follow-up research. Sure. Um, so I guess, you know, it, it isn't necessarily surprising to me, but I think it's potentially surprising to, um, you know, the, the folks that have conversations about concerns that about negative stereotyping of veterans. Um, I think, you know, I've long been skeptical that there's, a, you know, a, a great amount of negative sentiment towards veterans. And, you know, if you're familiar with the research I've done over the past 10 or so years, um, you know, that's that's part of my research agenda. I do think um, for many readers and viewers, it may be surprising to see just how low um, sort of negative negative perceptions of veterans are. Um, I think may, hopefully perhaps we can put to rest um, some of the most outsized fears, right? That the public has a kind of hostility towards veterans, at least um, based on the questions that we asked. I also um, didn't go into it too much in the, in the slide here, but um, in trying to unpack some of the, the distinction between people's willingness to encourage someone to join the military through ROTC or service academy versus the enlistment pathway, um, one of the additional findings was that about a third of those who would discourage um, their relative from enlisting would in fact encourage them to join the military um, through a service academy or a ROTC pathway. And for me, there's a lot to chew on there and a lot of potential future, future research to try to unpack what's undergirding that. Is it that the public has a really sophisticated understanding of the difference between what it means to be an officer or an enlisted person in the military? Or is it something about what they understand to be a kind of college first pathway? Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I think there's something um, potentially useful, some threads to potentially that are potentially useful to pull at there as we think about kind of the challenges in, in recruiting and staffing an all volunteer force right now. Thanks so much, Meredith. And maybe sure. we can pull some of those threads a little bit in the rest of this discussion. Um, Melissa, talking to you, you know, this survey itself did not dig into how public perceptions of veterans may vary based on characteristics of the veterans themselves. But you and I both have experience confounding people's expectations of what a veteran looks like. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you think American opinions of veterans may vary based on who we are, not based on survey, but just your your impressions? Yeah, I well, I'm happy to pull at some of these threads because I uh, thought that this was fascinating uh, in the overall takeaway that yes, it's not all doom and gloom. However, I just dropped in the chat here some that will add to, I think, this discussion some, uh, how do we put it, uh, differentials between enlistment by race, by minorities. I see within the chat, someone just mentioned about women. 
Um, and so it's, it's hard to look at this as a woman, as a woman of color and wonder where those subgroups fall in. And so I know we have to do a lot more research in some of these cross tabs here, but historically the military has always been a pathway to success for black and brown uh, minorities. It's always been going back to desegregation and being ahead of the country in integrating our armed forces to the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, a place where minorities could feel at home. Conversely, is that starting to shift? And that article I dropped by uh, military.com, uh, thanks to Steve Bannon for digging into some of these issues, makes you wonder why if in, in recruitment, some of the divisive politics of the day, some of the attack on quote unquote wokeness um, that speaks to the inclusivity and the increased inclusivity of the military, if that is having a converse uh, effect on those who are have a higher propensity to enlist. As an influencer, which I'm totally not comfortable with that term, um, I see it in the sense of folks who, when you talk to certain subgroups by race, by ethnicity, by women, certain aspects of this just kind of hit differently. Uh, in terms of the experiences that we have, the media is saturated with negative experiences, particularly hitting black and brown. And especially when I look at the Hispanic ratios, when you look at uh, the negative attributes that we saw uh, statistically significant numbers for for, uh, for Hispanics, I wonder if the uh, Vanessa Guillen murder case and, and other highly publicized ethical and uh, murderous you know, issues that have happened within our military have shaped opinions there. And so there's so much to unpack here based off of who you are. But when I look at the North, the West, when I see uh, black, brown, Asian, when you start looking into those subgroups of where there are higher negative correlations, but still a positive correlation that tells me we, and I'll associate myself in those subgroups, we still see this as a pathway to the middle class. We still see this as my father, my grandfather before me as a way to serve honorably, have access to the GI Bill, have access to all of those things. But we also see it with this kind of typical drudgery and a, a bit of um, almost malaise of the thing that you just have to do to get ahead. And for those of us who are you know, coming from these communities, maybe that's kind of the, the, the emotional correlation with military service. It's still honorable. It's still a, a wonderful path forward. I would also posit that that's a part of why you're seeing people say, well, don't enlist. Seems like it's a really rough time for you to enlist, but do become an officer. And, um, and I, I know uh, Mike has some thoughts on that as well. And I saw somebody posting in the chat about military families and their their perceptions on um, enlisting versus going an officer as well. And, and Mike, I do want to turn to you on that finding, pull on that thread that Meredith was mentioning on the, this finding that people are more supportive of young people commissioning rather than enlisting. I mean, do you think that most civilians have a really nuanced understanding of the differences in those career paths? Or what do you think is driving that difference? Well, I think a lot of it is uh, well, first of all, I wanted to thank Meredith and her colleagues for this tremendous study. It really contributes uh, immensely to the field and I think is uh, very useful for all of us who are involved in this in whatever function it happens to be. Um, in specific answer to the question, I don't think people really understand both the routes of ROTC and the service academies. Uh, again, uh, people probably couldn't name all of the service academies. Uh, uh, I, having spent much of my time up uh, teaching at the military academy, when Meredith happened to be on the uh, staff there teaching at the same time, uh, I would uh, attribute it to the good publicity that we try to get out there uh, is why people uh, want to go to the service academies, but I don't think that's really the case. I think probably more likely people are, it's the distinction that Meredith tried to make. Uh, it's do you go on a college route or do you go an enlisted route, which does not necessarily include college? Uh, it would have skewed the findings if you would have said, do you want to enlist, get the post, Montgomery Post 9-11 GI Bill, and then go to college as a result of going there? The other aspect is there are other ways to get to college now that there didn't used to be in the past. Uh, and so consequently, that may uh, decrease the number of folks uh, that would find themselves enlisting. And finally, uh, again, a pitch to read the full report. It was really interesting looking at kind of those cross tabs, not just the one third who recommended uh, against being enlisted, but being an officer. I noticed that 3% said that 
you should enlist in the military and you should not become an officer. Obviously, those people were somebody who had a bad company commander and uh, doesn't want anybody more to become officers. Uh, so it's worth reading the report in detail to learning a little bit more about that. And if or I get to feel very <laughs> proud of their sergeant major fathers. Yeah, Melissa, over to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and again, you know, family influences all of this. I think that's top of mind for, for this, uh, for these findings. And, and also, yes, thank you, Meredith, for really teasing this out throughout your entire body of work. As someone who's worked on the staff and faculty at West Point, but I am an ROTC uh, commissioner, uh, commissionee, and, uh, and then also, I went to ROTC and HBC. I went to Hampton University. Future research, and I think I'm going to caveat everything I say with the need for future research, um, and I'm just going to task Meredith with, with even more because I think there's a lot to hear to see here. Again, it, it kind of you know to put it in parlance, hits different um, for the commissioning source when you look at subgroups. So because you have a robust pathway through ROTC through HBCUs to include a very specific scholarship that are designated for HBCUs and a perception about the difficulty of getting an appointment to one of the service academies within the, the black and brown communities especially that could have correlation also to well go officer go ROTC you can still get a little bit of that same college experience you can pledge in the divine nine you can go and do other things that bring those other aspects of community to you that are not afforded to you at the academies I think that that does have a um, and, and influence over, at least within the black and brown communities, over whether you go officer enlisted and how do you do it by varying commissioning sources. And not to even name OCS, in which some would say, especially if they came through with a parent or a loved one who uh, enlisted and then did OCS, they could say, you can get to it and make up your mind later. You don't have to make these decisions at 17, 18 years old. Um, and so I think that there's a little, there's a lot to dig in there on the commissioning sources alone and those perceptions of enlistment versus commissioning at varying commissioning sources. Thanks, Melissa. Meredith, I want to ask you to go a little bit deeper on uh, something you touched on earlier, which is, you know, a lot of folks in the veteran space have expressed this concern that we're going to lose support, uh, especially now that we're out of Afghanistan, we're less involved in overseas conflicts. Your research really undermines that. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what you think undergirds this continuing really strong level of public support for veterans. Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, you know, looking back on even some of the research around kind of public attitudes around to veterans um, among sort of the Vietnam generation, right? This is where we started a narrative that like, you know, the spat upon veteran and sort of like the public really having um, very negative um, re reactions and responses to veterans. You know, there's, there's sort of a revisionist <laughs> history um, among the research community about the extent to which a lot of those things were myths or realities. I mean, literally the VA commissioned a study and a survey in 1980 and 1984 to, to, you know, called myths and realities to capture public attitudes about veterans. And so I, I think, you know, the strong levels of support are not unique to this general moment. I think what's aberrant is this sort of like fear mongering that there's widespread negative sentiment. So I'll just, you know, this is like my myth busting, the myth busting part of my career that I'm just going to keep, you know, keep um, hammering away at that. But but why why is the public supporting veterans? Well, because they serve the nation, right? <laughs> they do the yeoman's work of protecting our borders and protecting our people and protecting our way of life. And I mean, not to be too like Panglossian about all of that, but like, you know, it's an important and 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 rewarding and um, you know, it's a stand-up thing to do to serve your country. And I think that to me, that's really at the heart of why there's such important support. I think, you know, some of my other research outside of this in the past, um, why do people support policies and programs for veterans? Because I think they recognize that 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 military service does incur some harms. And, and we think it's important. It's sort of a social contract that if you step up and serve your country, your country will serve you when you need it uh, upon return. Um, I think, you know, there is sort of a growing recognition that veterans are of the all volunteer force are kind of positively selected. It's not actually that easy to get into the military, right? This myth that like, it's sort of the, you know, a poverty draft and sort of people who, you know, your options are go to jail or go to the military, all that stuff isn't true. Right. And so, 
um, that that comes out, right? There's there's a lot of positive sentiment because the people who join the military tend to be productive members of society, and that that's reinforcing. Um, I, there's also one thing in it. It kind of dovetails with Melissa's comments, but it's it's coming at it from a slightly different angle, and and it's not the sort of like how do the the different sort of demographic or identity groups that are responding to the survey think about these questions. Um, but it's like a method, it's a really nitpicky methodological thing. So I'm sorry, you know, for the non-researchers on the call. But, you know, the way we ask questions, right, when we say, like, how do you think about a veteran? Well, there is some RAND research that we did that isn't presented here, where we just ask people, like, think about a veteran, describe what, what your mental image is. And then the, the kind of modal mental image is like an older white dude, Um and so, you know, if if I'm if I'm self-critical here, you know, part of me wonders, like, is there such a strong positive sentiment because the modal imagery when we talk about veterans looks like a person who is a privileged person in society that we tend to valorize and you know have a lot of positive sentiment for. And if we if we could get experimental and ask people like how do you feel about a veteran that looks like this with these characteristics? How do you how do you respond or what are your perceptions of veterans that look like this? That to me is re a really interesting avenue for for future research as well. Sorry, that's a really long answer. No, that's really interesting. Um and I appreciate that nuance and um and thanks for bringing that up. I, I will note you, that, you know, I look, for example, at TSA agents as folks who have stepped up to try to serve and protect and keep everyone safe, and they don't get that same level of adulation, even though they may be incurring some risk as well. So I, I'm still going to ponder, you know, what it is about the military uniform that I don specifically that that digs into that. Melissa, if you want to talk about that as well, when I come to you next, I do want to ask, so you mentioned earlier, you are now an influencer as a upsetting as that is, you're no longer the target demographic to be recruited, but uh, somebody who's helping young people think through uh, what path they may want to take. Um, you know, my assumption is that knowing vets personally and media representations of military service may have traditionally shaped some of the perceptions that young people have before they, you know, can decide whether or not to join. But, you know, I have young kids too, and today's young people, they're really they're less likely to know somebody who has served if they're not in a military family. And their media consumption is just so different than previous generations. So I'm curious, you know, though this survey doesn't really get into it so much, but what do you think is going to shape perceptions on these topics among Gen Z? Yeah, and I would love to see the Jammers data that comes out on this that, that eventually tells us what this Gen Z feel. I will say anecdotally in my household with a 16-year-old who is starting to look at, at college counseling enlistments not even in his vernacular. And that's um, and now biased. We have a dual military family here, my, my spouse and I, um, but he's also, but we're also officers. And so, um, you know, even though he has enlisted, we have enlisted within our family. It's just not something that he thinks of. He thinks it's hard. He thinks that it's something that it has arduous labor attached to it. And, uh, and I think that those perceptions um, permeate throughout the spaces. Um, as excited as all of us, you know, old farts may be to use a technical term here about be all you can be coming back to the army. And, you know, the jingle just runs through my head even as I say it. Um, and yes, kudos to the soldiers for life who are, who are cheering that. My son isn't seeing that at all. That hasn't seen the commercials, hasn't seen it, because doesn't watch TV, watches by streaming, they're on Discord or Twitch. I'm happy to see the uh, recruiting commands, you know, going into these various mediums. I don't know how much they're just getting skip ad and just moving on to what it is that they want to do. But um, when they hear, again, the overwhelming media uh, depictions of the military being a place that is unethical, a place that can be uh, downright even uh, harmful to yourself. Uh, your service could be a detriment to your life. And uh, it, that's something that's hard to combat with, with feel good stories, even though they also know that you literally can be all that you can be by the empowerment and by the benefits that come through military service. And so it's uh, in, in terms of the influencer space, we know that we have tons of work to do. Um, there are parallels within the U.S. population as a whole, and an article that I put in for Military Times, or it's military.com, kind of speaks to that a little bit also, in that we're seeing college enrollment of males in general dropping. We're seeing um, the, uh, the questioning of what does it mean to go to college as we have a student loan debate, and 
you know, a lot of things that were typically a part of that dominant conversation that you need a degree in order to achieve in life, that this is a pathway to middle class, whether you're black and brown, or even if you're, you're white, this is your way out of whatever your situation is and will give you a, um, a leg up or to mirror this point, um, you know, even for those who have served, who are revered and, and seen as these, you know, paragons of society, you're seeing that decline overall because I think that maybe in the influencer space, that's the attitude toward college, towards some white collar work right now of whether that all of those things that traditionally we held as the pathway for a teenager to take in order to become an adult, we're seeing that sea change within our society. Thanks, Melissa. I appreciate that. Um, Mike, Meredith's presentation got a little bit into, you know, some differences in survey respondents' perceptions of vets and military service by um, demographics, political affiliation, some other characteristics. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about those differences and, and the lack of differences, the fact that even though there are some nuanced differences, really there are broad similarities. Do you, anything you want to share on that? Yeah, I think when you when you look at it again, I'd encourage everybody to read the report in detail, uh, but you don't see that much of a difference, although it is teased out. And the way that it's teased out, I think is pretty consistent. It is from the distance from the veteran that the positivity goes down or the negativity goes up. In other words, uh, when you look at it, the veterans feel most positive about these kinds of characteristics and dichotomies. The uh, non-veterans less so. Veterans' families are still positive, but less positive than veterans are. And then when you look regionally, um, the North and the West tends to be less positive than the South and the Midwest, uh, which tends to be more positive. Uh, and I think I would, uh, they also did political party there with Republican, Democrat, Independent, and others. I would say that that is probably less, I think that's more correlation than causation uh, would be my uh, uninformed uh, view on this. I think it's, if you looked at the cross tabs, Republicans uh, would tend to be more in the uh, South and in the Midwest than uh, Democrats. So that you're really looking at the red, you're capturing the red blue divide which is not that conservatives have a particular, Republicans have a particular opinion. It's just that they happen to be living in those places that happen to be around veterans. Now, the implications of that are problematic for recruiting because where are you going to fish? You're gonna fish in the pond that where you're most likely to catch, which means we're gonna be more and more Midwest, we're gonna be more and more South, and those people that are gonna be in the North and in the West are going to have fewer and fewer veterans, and we're 50 years into the all-volunteer force, 50 more years from the all-volunteer force, you know, we'll call both people from Oregon and all six people from New York that are in the military, and everybody else is going to be from Georgia and North Carolina. <laughs> that's... <laughs> that's an interesting vision for our future, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, folks are are working to um, avoid that sort of outcome because certainly for me, serving with people from all over the country was really beneficial, and I think it was for for them and, as well. And actually, that's one of the points. Getting back to the previous question, that is a huge advantage of the service academies, in that by law, you have five cadets from every congressional district. So by definition, you have to have diversity across the entire nation in geographic diversity, which is very helpful in terms of your officer corps. That's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we're about to turn to the audience Q&A. So just a reminder to folks, if you have questions and you haven't yet dropped them into the Q&A, please feel free to do that now. And I'll open that up in just a moment. Um, I have seen some questions coming in the chat as well. So I'll try to monitor that as well and use that to pull out some questions. Um, so one final question for all of you before we turn to those audience questions, um, and we can just go in the order we've been going in, so Meredith and Melissa and then Mike, um, you know, the survey gives insights into perceptions of how uh, how perceptions of veterans and military service may affect the behavior of influencers, right? Are you going to recommend service? But how do you think these perceptions may affect recruitment, which is, you know, a bit of a leap 
And, and we have a little less data on that. I know, Meredith, you're very like reluctant to go too far out on this limb, but just if you have any any gut thoughts uh, that you might want to share with us, and, and then we'll turn to audience questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, sort of dovetails a little bit on something Melissa said earlier, and 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 Mike was bringing it up too, right? Um, the fact that that individual, the older individuals had more positive stereotypes of veterans um, says something potentially about you know where influencers may sit in terms of you know recommending military service to young people, but the fact that young people actually. It's not that they have negative views of veterans, but they have less positive views than older individuals. Um, and I think that, you know, there is a little bit of a, a creeping concern for me that that the youngest generations, right, those those who have seen their older brothers, their older cousins, um, you know, maybe come back from military service and and see what contemporary military service looks like, you know, in the rear view mirror for, for those closest to them. Um, I have a little bit of concerns about that for, for what the next generation is thinking. Um, and I would also just say, you know, and this is like not exactly in the report, it's just from being a human in the world. Um, the, the ongoing kind of questioning of the value of a college degree, I think also potentially challenges um, the value of joining the military if for many, the, the major benefit that people are seeking is yes, serving their country, but also getting access to college um, resources. And if people no longer feel like college is worth it, well, maybe joining the military to get benefits to pay for college is not worth it anymore. That that gives me that keeps me up a little bit at night. Yeah, and I, if I could jump in here, I'll simply say that you know everything that Mike said about this increasingly became, being a family business, um, increasingly being a regional business. Um, I, I can't recall from what year the Pew study came out a few years ago that spoke just to those trends and spoke to um, the uh, potential for groupthink, which is something that you know bothers me quite a bit. That keeps me up at night in any institution where you have such similar um, views, and, and I won't speak to you know what I think of Pentagon groupthink, but um, when you have the, the same conclusions that are reached by the same group of people who are confronted with the same data sets and confronted with uh, uh, their own mirroring of themselves within those problems, and so you see that kind of trickle down into policy. I'll simply say that, you know, because I see a few comments in the Q&A that allude to it, um, and then what Kay alluded to at the top of your question to me, I'm, I couldn't be more aware of my not being a male, white male, uh, serving in the military and being an officer to boot. Um, I was less than 1% of the Army when I was in, because I was also a military intelligence officer. There was no one who looked like me, no one. Um, that hurt my mentorship that helped hurt my pers my own personal perceptions and probably as a young officer hurt my spiel that I would give her attention probably at a certain point, especially since the time when I exited service was at the height of the wars um, in 2009. And so all of that carries. It's also why I'm highly cognizant of the things that I say, because I know that there are those who are watching, many who are watching even right now who are thinking, well, do I see someone who had a positive experience within the military themselves who looks like me or it looks like someone who does not look like me, but would Melissa Bryant's experience then speak to or Kayla Williams experience then speak to what it is my experience would be if I encouraged my, my daughter to join the military, if I encouraged my um, you know, racially or, or ethnic, ethnic minority uh, son or uh, non-binary um, you know, let's not even get into where we are right now in terms of the LGBTQ plus um, feelings and sentiment that are out there and the very valid feelings of not having a place within the military because of the conversations that are happening right now, all these things do influence. And, and I will test that personally. I don't think a day goes by where I don't get a DM from someone asking about my service, would I still do it? How do I feel about it? Would I send my kids? But that question is there. And we look at it through those intersectional lenses. And Mike, you get the last word on this question. Uh, no, I think that it's uh, certainly important to take a look at uh, that uh, from various perspectives. And I think the the negative reaction that you see in the Ar Military Times article of, of the reaction to wokeness may have been because the military approached it incorrectly. Uh, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, uh, in the old days, this was leadership. You, I didn't get a choice of what 
soldiers came into my battery, I didn't get a choice that my first brigade commander was uh, um, Fred Gordon, West Point class of 62, retired as uh, African-American, two-star general. And uh, we, it, you by definition, include everybody that you have. And that's part of the leadership that is an inherent part of the military. Do we always do it right? No. Do we have enough diverse folks? No. Uh, but when Melissa was a military intelligence officer, she could look up to Barb Fast, who isn't a woman of color, but happened to be the head J2 and uh, was my uh, military intelligence commander. And, and that I think is a credit to us as leadership long before we had diversity and inclusion initiatives. I think we, the military may have gone wrong by making this a new thing that they're doing instead of capitalizing on the fact that we've been in, an inclusive military getting better at it all the time over the last 50 years once we started the all-volunteer force. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that thought. Um, I'm going to direct uh, the first question over to you, Mike, and this one's coming from our uh, colleague down under, Robert Lipiat, who's asking, if um, do you think there's any impact um, caused by the fact that some veteran service organizations seem to really focus on a, a broken veteran narrative to garner support from, from donors, especially philanthropic to support. Do you think that plays into some of these public yeah. perceptions of veterans? Yeah, I, I'm afraid that it probably does, and I'll have to sort of do truth in advertising. I'm w the president of American Armed Forces Mutual Aid Association, which is actually the oldest nonprofit. But we're, we're one of two nonprofits that don't take any uh, charity, don't, don't take any donations. We're a mutual aid association. Um, however, the largest and most prominent of the, there's 38,000 veteran service organizations based upon a CNAS study, and they uh, contribute about $1.6 billion to the military and veterans. The four largest ones, listen to their names. The Wounded Warrior Project, uh, that has 388 million the next is disabled American veterans. The next is par uh, paralyzed veterans of America. And then you get to VFW and American Legion. And many of them, even if you don't have wounded, paralyzed, or disabled in your names, are emphasizing the victim mentality uh, that approaches veterans. I think it is far stronger for organizations. And, and again, those are great organizations. I'm a life member of uh, several of them. And they do great work, but in order to get the support that they need, sometimes they inadvertently are pushing the victimhood narrative. Other organizations like Blue Star Families, like Team Red, White, and Blue, like AFMA, uh, like many others, have the more balanced approach that stresses that uh, veterans are, in fact, are victors and contributors to society and are stressing those kinds of things, which I think is a much more balanced narrative. And the good thing is Meredith is saying that uh, uh, her research has found that the negative narrative is not, in fact, uh, winning out. But to the extent that it's there, it's probably there because of a lot of the perceptions of uh, veteran service organizations that emphasize the negativity. Thanks for that. Um, Meredith, Melissa talked earlier about how, you know, some folks really do still see the military as a pathway to opportunity. And we have a question from Bob Wolf in the chat about whether the report breaks these perceptions down by income level of respondents and do and wondering if lower income families have a more positive perception of military service and and or enlisting. Um, I am just going to the table and I'll tell you what the the additional variables are that we um, were able to include. So we include respondent gender, their age, their race, ethnicity, their location of residence, their educational attainment, their income category, their own military service experience, their family's military service experience, and political party. And so we do have information about income. And again, I'll I'll direct you to the report to, you know, to kind of like look at the details because it's multiple categories and with education, right? Like I don't want to be just sort of like firing off a quick summary that's not as nuanced as the analysis. 
I think you have a lot of really academically minded folks who are watching today because we have a number of other like very in the weeds uh, questions um, <laughs> about your specific findings, including one that may be really quick to answer, which is, mm -hmm. did you ask in this particular survey about um, differences in how Americans view pre 9-11 versus post 9-11 veterans? We did not. We just sort of said veterans. Um, mm -hmm. And and again, you know, we didn't caveat that by, you know, female veteran, male veteran, black veteran, white veteran, pre 9-11, post 9-11, Iraq veteran versus Afghanistan veteran. Um, all of these, all of these are potentially likely um, additional characteristics of, of one's veteran experience that might change perceptions, but we just didn't, you know, have a space to kind of double the questions by asking about two different types. Right. Yeah. Um, Melissa, I think you, you, talked about this a little bit from your personal perspective. And Mike, I think you were touching on this as well. But um, we have a question in the chat about how, you know, we know that now we do have a lot of um, folks who join the military who are coming from military families. You, you both touched on that at least a little bit. And so the Mike uh, Sully Sullivan in the Q&A asked if we are risking having a dearth of diversity of thought if we are getting a lot of folks who are joining up with this family legacy and uh, whether that could also just encourage uh, a, a trend of veterans perhaps being more isolated from regular Americans. Either of you have thoughts on that? I do. I, I have thoughts on it uh, from the, you know, again, let's go back to the, you know, the, the end wokeness debate and whether that's impacting recruitment. We are at an inflection point within the military where we need more diversity of thought. We need more diversity of backgrounds. We need people, let's just use cyber as the nebulous terms. We need to bring in people from communities from the North, from the West Coast, from you know the, the places that normally would not think military service. We need to bring them into the military to fight tomorrow's wars, to fight today's wars right now. And, uh, and then to also, you know, speak to uh, defense as a whole as a, as an honorable profession, you know, like two decades of war may have pulled us away from thinking just war and not servicing to your fellow uh, citizen in the way that you liked it, uh, likened it to the TSA earlier in your comments, Kayla. And so I do think that we face a crisis um, of groupthink. Um, you face that in any institution that becomes its own insular ecosystem that doesn't really bring in those other types of thought. And we're seeing it, I use again, Intel, so my mind gravitates towards those kinds of things, but you see it in that lack of diversity in being able to recruit specifically for the challenging MOSs that we have identified currently and the ones that we know we're gonna need for the next 10, 20 years and beyond. We've got to at least try to appeal through encouragement of, I have a positive experience within my service, regardless of where I look like or how I identify. And I was able to bring my special skills and talents to this institution that not only buoyed them, but continued to serve me throughout the rest of my life, you know, as I crossed over into being a veteran. Yes, we, there, there are setbacks, but um, I, I dare to find a better program with a better workers comp than VA for having gone through occupational hazards. So to put it a little bit glibly. <laughs> Mike, anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think you're exactly uh, right in making sure that we do have the diversity of opinions. And that's got to be, uh, you've got to maintain that diversity throughout the profession, and, and whether that's promoting uh, people to the uh, appropriate rank, including them in schools. I think, uh, uh, again, sending people to civilian graduate schools, which is a program that the Army tends to do very well and other services do as well. I think that that's an important part of it. And then, frankly, uh, the civilian leadership of the military, and this gets to the civil military relations, civilian control of the military is very important to ensure that you do have those uh, inputs. Uh, it's noteworthy that all of the uh, significant changes that have taken place over the last 50 years, whether it was the all-volunteer force, uh, the um, 1986 uh, 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 jointness reforms, uh, the um, uh, don't ask, don't tell, all of those were civilian things that tended to be uh, introduced uh, and some might say imposed on the uniform military that they otherwise would not have adopted. And so that uh, reinforces the importance of civilian military control. Thank you so much. 
Um, I will note there there are questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A and the chat, um, again, really digging into the weeds of this research and asking about things that I know are not addressed in this study, uh, like um, what somebody called performative patriotism, and if that's uh, something that that may be happening in, in some of these surveys in Meredith. I know that isn't tackled in this work, but I know you've done that before in some of your other research. So I'd encourage folks to use Google Scholar and uh, look for Meredith, and you'll find some other work that she's done on, on some of these more nuanced questions. Um, another thing that that is mentioned in the, the question is, is asking how veterans themselves see their service and whether veterans would recommend military service to young people, um, asking if our views track with other Americans. I will just note, you know, as a prior enlisted service member, I encourage my own kids that if they want to go into the military, that they go the officer route. I loved being enlisted and I want them to have an easier life than I did. And perhaps that is me stereotyping uh, officers, but um, that, that uh, I, N of one, I don't discourage military service, but I do encourage uh, uh, commissioning rather than enlisting for what it's worth. Um, we are Closing, running out of time a bit. So I do just want to ask everyone if you have any final thoughts that you want to share. I know several of you have been kind of keeping an eye on the Q&A yourselves. You've been watching things pop up in the chat. I haven't been able to get to every single question. There have been a lot of really fascinating questions. So just if you each want to take... Um, one minute <laughs> or less each to share any closing thoughts that you have about perceptions of veterans, military service, or why this all matters for our democracy. Oh my gosh, one minute. Um, what does this mean for democracy, Meredith? <laughs> Good Lord. Um, what does this mean for democracy? I, I think, you know, how we think about the people who serve our country, and you you pointed out that there's many other ways to serve your country than serving in the military, but this is the most prominent one. Um, you know, if if I think we're on a good footing, ish, uh, to the extent that the public does seem to be supportive of those who serve, and you know, there's economic factors, there's there's all kinds of other reasons why people choose to join or not join the military, but. I will say I feel more comforted than I thought I would, um, and that I think many people think uh, they should on the basis of how Americans feel about veterans, right? I do not think to the extent that our all-volunteer force may be on shaky ground, or if there's any implication of that for American democracy, I don't think it comes from the fact that the American public does not support um, those who serve in the military once they get out. Was that a minute? I don't know. You did great. Melissa? Yeah, I'm going to go straight to the last one of the uh, penultimate comments here I see from Elizabeth McKenzie, and that is, you know, an area to explore is the correlation between American exceptionalism and, you know, that national identity and, and how closely it is linked with our military. Military, our, our, our country is forced through the military, and so we are inextricably linked. That American exceptionalism is why be all you can be got me in the army. And so that was that ideal that I think is still present. I think that's still expressed within these sentiments. There are myriad ways we could tease out this and, and do further research on, again, those intersectional cross tabs. I have my gut feelings. I have the feelings I have from crisscrossing the country in my various capacities to talk with uh, veterans and military and those thinking about military service about these very questions. Um, but there's just there's, there's a dearth of data to, to back up some of those assumptions in, in many cases. And so I appreciate everyone's comments and questions along those lines. There's so much more that we should dig into uh, in order to help our recruiting commands. We need a strong military in our country. It is synonymous with American democracy. Thanks, Melissa. I will note there was another question in the Q&A asking whether young people's perceptions of the US government writ, writ large, which I think ties into these comments about American exceptionalism. And if, if that starts to get shaky, will that affect recruiting? So I think that is, you know, it goes along with what you're saying and it is an interesting um, interesting question for further research in the long run. And Mike, over to you. Uh, I'll have two quick closing comments. The, the first is uh, related to uh, what was just discussed. I think the good thing that comes out of Meredith's, although it wasn't stated in the report, is this, um, we have finally, uh, the evolution after Vietnam of separating the troops from the policies is pretty complete. People see people that are serving in the military as being completely different 
from whether you agree or disagree with the war, the commander in chief, whether it's Trump or Biden or Obama or Bush. Um, and, and that's reflected in the um, outcome. Uh, the other is, I really like the comments and uh, it would be great for future research on the reserves and National Guard. Mm -hmm. They are the local areas, they are the diverse areas. And even if we only have two soldiers in the active army from Oregon, you'll have the entire Oregon National Guard. Uh, and uh, General Hokins in the head of the National Guards from Oregon, so that's why I pick on uh, Oregon. But um, I think that that is another very important capability that the active military and the Department of Defense in general needs to leverage both in its recruiting and it's in, in its outreach, it accomplishes many of the things that we've talked about in terms of addressing diversity and in terms of geographical dispersion and in terms of uh, getting closer and closer to the American public. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, this has been a really fascinating discussion today. I'm honored to have been able to moderate. Um, obviously, we've seen a ton of engagement in the chat, in the Q&A. So I appreciate that all of the panelists really made this an engaging and very informative discussion. I want to thank Carrie and the Veterans Policy Research Institute for hosting this event. Meredith, thank you again for presenting. Melissa, Mike, thank you so much for participating. And if you enjoyed this discussion and you want to get updates about future events like this, upcoming research we have on things like the veteran serving nonprofit space and more, and other research that Meredith presented uh, already and will continue to put out in the future, please go to the RAND Veterans Policy Research Institute website, scroll down to the bottom, add your email to the Stay Informed box and uh, that way you will get all of our invitations and newsletters and updates and reports and releases thanks everyone so much for joining and have a fantastic day cheers